united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning, y muy buenos días to all of you who are watching live this morning. And whether you're watching live or watching a recording of this program, welcome to another edition of United with Christ, a program that focuses on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his word that tells us that those who believe in him are united in him as one. My name is Robert Dominguez, and I have the pleasure of currently being on staff at Jesus Chapel Church on the west side of El Paso, Texas. But as well, I have the pleasure and the blessing to have started the church planting process. So we're very excited for the new thing that the Lord is doing. So I'll ask you if you want to pray for us, pray for God's leading and timing, and ultimately that his will be done, we would be very grateful as we celebrate the new thing that the Lord is doing here in El Paso, Texas. And speaking about El Paso, Texas, I will forever be grateful for this, not only this program, but this television station, Life Christian, that I believe for over 30 years has been faithful to proclaiming, to sharing God's word, not just in El Paso, but now around the world. They do a great job here at the station. Every single one of them is kind, truly a representative of Christ. And I thank all of you who are watching for their support for Life Christian Television, whether that be through financial support, words of encouragement, and of course, prayer, because we know prayer is the greatest blessing that we could give to our loved ones. And speaking about prayer, I need you to know this. If you need prayer for any reason for yourself, a loved one, a coworker, someone that you just want desperately to come to Christ, and I think we all want people desperately to come to Christ, there is a prayer line that, right here on the screen that you could call that is 915-532-8518. A. Please call us so that we could pray for you and bless you as we trust our good Father in taking care of us. And well, speaking about prayer, let's go ahead and go into prayer before we start discussing God's word today and surrendering all things to the Lord and thanking him for all that he gives us. Will you join me in prayer right now? Father, we are so thankful for all that you give us. We are thankful that today you gave us a new day with life and not just life, but the opportunity to get to know you more, to grow in our relationship with you more so that we may love you. Lord, we thank you for television programs such as United with Christ, for television stations such as Life Christian. We thank you for what you are doing around the world so that we could grow in your word. And Father, that is what I am asking right now for every person watching live or at a future time, that Holy Spirit, that you speak to us and that we are able to not just accept and understand what you are giving to us, speaking to us, but that we may apply it so that we may be able to give fruit and glorify you, Father, in all that we do. So, Father, we surrender this time to you right now as you guide us in your precious word. We thank you, Jesus Christ, for all that you give us and all that we have in you. It's in your precious and powerful, unifying name that we say amen. Now, I have one more thank you to give, and that is to my beloved friend, mentor, the one who gave me my first opportunity to enter ministry and has discipled me ever since. Of course, that is Pastor Mark Schumacher over there at New Wine Fellowship. He cared for me last week because last week I had this nasty stomach, stomach bug that Pastor Laura and I were discussing, but we won't discuss too much about those details. I'm a lot better now, but I'm thankful for him for sharing the word with y'all when I was supposed to share it with you. And what he discussed last week was Acts chapter one, and he got about to the beginning of Acts chapter two. 
And that's where I would like to begin today because Acts chapter 2, honestly, is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Why, you ask? Well, I think a lot of you who, who, who are familiar with Acts chapter 2 see that it's not only where we find the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that, that promised helper that Jesus Christ told his followers about. Remember, he said that it's better for me to leave so that this helper could come and help you. Well, that's the Holy Spirit who shows up powerfully in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But as well, we see the impact the Holy Spirit has on these new believers, this uh, beginning church. And we see their response, which for us is an example and a model to follow. Because you know what, y'all? The Holy Spirit that was there with them all those years ago is the same Holy Spirit that is with us today. And for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we have the blessing, the honor to say the Holy Spirit lives in us. So, so that's where we're going to start off. We, we start off in... Acts chapter 2, verse 4, where we see that the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles who were gathered in Jerusalem, remember? And what happens to them as the Holy Spirit comes upon them? Well, verse 4 says that they start speaking in the uh, in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that is so important. That is going to be the theme throughout Acts is that it's the Holy Spirit that enables and empowers us. Well, they don't just start speaking in any tongues. They started speaking in familiar tongues. Now, for a little bit of, of a setting of what was going on here, while this is happening, verse 5 tells us that now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Can you believe the, the scene there in Jerusalem, just a gathering of people from all over the, the world speaking different languages? Imagine if you're at Disneyland, right? And I think that's a time that I've seen different cultures speaking different languages, some maybe from China and Japan, from Mexico, Europe, obviously America all gathered in one place for one purpose, to enjoy the amusement park, but somewhat separated because of the language barrier. Well, check out what's happening. When these apostles are empowered, filled with the Holy Spirit, and they start speaking in tongues, it's not just these, this random noise or, or tongues that are incomprehensible. No, rather, they're the languages of the nations that were there in Jerusalem. And we see that in verse 11. We read in verse 11 that it says, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring, they said, the wonders of God in our own tongues. Did you see what the Holy Spirit did there? He made a way for people of all nations to hear proclamations to the Lord in their original language. And, and that's the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is so that we, through the Holy Spirit, may proclaim the wonders of God, that we may demonstrate to the world the wonders of Jesus Christ, that we may glorify God. And y'all, I, I can't stress that enough, that that is a purpose of all of our lives. And I will say this, this is a purpose for the believer of Christ and the unbeliever alike. We are all here on this planet at this very moment to glorify God, our creator. This is a purpose that we share. And we find that in Isaiah chapter 43, verse seven. This is a verse that I like to go over regularly. Um, with those who attend our service, it says in verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We see there, why did God create us? He created us to glorify him. And that's why the Holy Spirit came in on the day of Pentecost so that the nations around the world could hear proclamations glorification to the Almighty in their language. 
But now when all this is going on, we see two types of people. We see those who are very perplexed by this and start asking questions, how can this be? Imagine going back to Disneyland and maybe we're in line for It's a Small World and hopefully you're not in line for that because that's, that's just maybe not the best ride there. But imagine that you start seeing the, the Japanese man being able to understand the Italian and the Italian starts understanding the Russian and the Russian starts understanding the one from Mexico. And they're in line, what would you say? Well, well, this is very strange. How do we explain this? Well, there were some who were asking, what does this mean? And we read this in, in verse chapter, I mean, chapter two, verse 12. But then there are some who started critiquing or criticizing what was going on. They started passing judgment of what they did not understand. And I'll read you verse 12 and 13 of Acts chapter 2. We're going to stay in this chapter. Starting at verse 12, it says, Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Y'all, it's very important for us when we see something, especially maybe in the church that we don't understand initially, let, let's not write it off. Let's ask questions. Let's first off ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, what are you doing here that I might not understand or may have seen before? Go to your pastor, a trusted Christian leader, a trusted Christian resources to be able to answer the questions that you may have. Because honestly, we all have questions. We're all growing in our knowledge of the word and of the works of the Holy Spirit. But let's not be like those who started judging those who were filled with the Holy Spirit and saying, hey, they're, they're drunk. Well, hey, thank God for a Christian leader by the name of Peter, I, I think you've heard of him, who stands up and starts giving clarity of what is happening here in Jerusalem. So Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is then enabled to preach the word. And, I, and I'm just going to read what he preaches there to those who have these questions and those who are judging. I'm going to read verses 14 through 21, if you'd like to follow along. And I'm reading in the New International Version this morning, starting at verse 14. We read, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and the moon, uh, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And I love verse 21. And everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. So we see that we have this Christian leader, this apostle, the very own Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, is explaining, is teaching, is preaching to those uh, assembled of what the Holy Spirit is doing here. And it's fascinating because he is now going into the Old Testament, talking about prophecy that we see in the book of, of Joel. And this prophecy, if you're wondering, that we just read is found in chapter 2. And he's saying, guys, it's being fulfilled. The Holy Spirit has come, which is also... Um, a prophecy that is fulfilled that was given by Christ that, hey, this helper is going to come. And the point of it was to do what? We see here multiple times is to prophesy. That is to speak the message that God is giving. And y'all, there isn't a greater message than we find in verse 21 that says, everyone 
who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you see what happens here. God the Father sends Jesus Christ, his son, who lived the perfect life for us, dies on the cross to pay the penalty that we should have paid because of our rebellion and of our sin, our disobedience. But because he lived a perfect life and gave the perfect sacrifice, he is resurrected on the third day. And now through him and his victory over death and sin, all who believe in him, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But not only will they be saved, but now we have the Holy Spirit come upon us. And now we too are able to proclaim the wonders of God. There is a transformation. There is a response that happens to us when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And we see that most evidently towards the the end of this chapter. If we jump to verse 41 of the same chapter, chapter 2 of Acts, see how the people in attendance reacted, responded to the proclamation of the Lord saves those who call on his name. We read in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day in one day. This is why the Holy Spirit is so powerful and beautiful and important to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling and empowering believers like you and me, because there's no difference between Peter and those believers today. We believe in the same Christ, believe in the same God, believe in the same Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit was in Peter, he is in us, and we can now proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we too could see unbelievers be baptized and come to the Lord 3,000 in one day. And what I love that we see here in Acts chapter 2 is not only that they were saved, but how they respond to salvation. And in verse 42, and this is one of my favorite verses of all of the Bible, we read, they, these new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Do you see that? They were devoted to, and devoted a teaching to prayer, to fellowship, to being together. For me, this is the model for us, a church, to follow. This is what I'm trying for the, the church plant that I am blessed to, to start leading towards is this. May we be devoted to the teaching. May we be devoted to prayer, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to each other and to Christ. But what I also taught our church recently is this, is before they were devoted to these four things in chapter two, verse 42, before they were baptized, before they proclaimed Jesus Christ as a, their savior, we see that they asked a question. In verse 37 of this same chapter, they ask brothers, What shall we do? Have you ever asked that question? I know I've asked myself that question multiple times, probably in a week. What shall we do? What shall we do today? What shall we do this weekend? What are we going to do at at the end of the year? We make a lot of plans. We try to figure out what our next steps are. What shall we do as believers? What shall we do as Christians? What shall we do as a body of Christ, a church with everything that is happening around the world. It's an important question to ask regularly. But what's important for us in this chapter is to understand the context in which they ask this question. Because if we read all of verse 37, especially the beginning of it, we see why they're asking, what shall we do? In verse 37, we read, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart by something, something they heard. And think about that phrase, a cutting of the heart. Something pierced them so deeply and profoundly that they wanted to ask, that 
a, a question of what shall we do next? This is what we call a conviction. When something is confronted to us or given to us for us to process to the point of we need to change something seriously and quickly. Well, talking about context, what they heard was something that was extremely painful to hear. And that's what Peter had said in the verse prior. So if we go to verse 36, let's see what Peter had just told them. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Imagine that here, Jews of, of all nations, amazed by the wondrous uh, miracles of the Holy Spirit, being able to hear their language spoken by Galileans, by Israelites, come to hear that it is Jesus that saves, but yet it was the Jews that crucified Christ. And how difficult that would be to process is here is the one who has come to give salvation. Yet this is the exact same one that they put on the cross. But the truth is, friends, we all have crucified Christ. And what I mean by that is every single time that we have disobeyed God, that we have said, not today, God, I, I want to do it my way. I, I want to go down this path or make my own choices. Well, friends, that, that really is rebellion. And the price of rebellion, the price of sin is, is death. And that's why Christ had to be crucified so that he could pay the penalty, the price for our sins and our rebellion. So we are just as guilty as the Jewish people over 2,000 years ago who were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, and put him on the cross. We're just as guilty today in that. Paul writes to the Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we have all sinned, then the question for all of us is, brothers, what shall we do? Well, Peter gives a response. In verse 38, we read, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is not a new message. This is exactly how the gospel of Matthew starts out. John the Baptist comes preaching in the wilderness in verse two of chapter three saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And even Jesus Christ, this is his first message is, Right after he is tested in the wilderness and right before he starts appointing his disciples, we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, that Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God of heaven has come near. And what does repent mean, guys? Literally, it means a changing of our mind. We need to change our mind. Paul writes to the Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we do that mainly by first confessing that, Jesus, I'm aware of my sin. I need saving and I need you to be my savior. And once you confess Jesus Christ as not just savior, but the Lord of your life, King, then you were given the promise that the Holy Spirit is now indwelling in you. And Paul wrote to Titus, in verse, in chapter three, verse five, check this out, that he, Jesus saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So this transformation of mind, this renewing of the mind is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit to indwell in us by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But what also should we do? We need to be in God's word. 
Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. So let us focus on the glory of God through the word of God, through praying and having a relationship with God and being able to embrace that, yes, though all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, all are justified freely by his grace, the Lord's grace, through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. So friends, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to be my Lord, and I want you to be my Savior, and I want the Holy Spirit to renew my mind so that I may repent and follow you. So, Father, I pray for all those who are listening here right now that they may accept your Son as Lord and Savior. May they be transformed by the Holy Spirit. May we all repent of what you show us of what we need to change. And we, may we all grow in the knowledge of who you are as we come to love you more and share your love with the world. We pray all of this in the most powerful and redeeming name there is, Jesus Christ. And all those watching said, amen. Friends, thank you so much for your time. I love all of those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. But as my mom would always say, God loves you more. Until next time, we remain united with Christ.